Buonasera, eh, sono molto contento di poter aprire questo evento questa sera e, e lo faccio anche con un pizzico di emozione perché quando con Sebastiano Maffettone eh, parlavamo della eh, bellezza di poter immaginare all'interno di una scuola di business, all'interno della business school di un'università che si occupava di management di business come la LUIS, un centro che potesse occuparsi di, di etica eh, e che anzi nasceva proprio con il nome di Ethos, eh, forse in quel momento era un sogno poter pensare che un centro di etica all'interno di una università eh, e all'interno della business school di un'università potesse poi parlare di arte e occuparsi di arte. Quindi oggi è un po' un, un percorso progettuale che, che si realizza sempre di più, ma devo dire che nelle mani di, di Sebastiano Maffettone molte, eh, molte parole diventano poesie, molte parole e poesie diventano fatti e quindi io sono molto contento di poter eh, dire due parole di introduzione a questo, a questo evento, una nuova geografia dell'arte, avendo peraltro la grande fortuna oggi di avere qui in università, in questo evento che abbiamo imparato a chiamare Figital, un po' fisico, un po' digitale, in questa eh, terribile epoca che stiamo vivendo, che tutti quanti noi ci auguriamo duri perlomeno nella parte dell'emergenza sanitaria, della durezza, della sofferenza, il minor tempo possibile, eh, una nuova geografia dell'arte. E sono tutte parole molto belle. È bella la parola nuova perché abbiamo bisogno di novità, vogliamo, ci fa piacere che arrivino novità, che siano novità interessanti. La parola geografia è una parola dimenticata rispetto alla quale eh, eh, abbiamo sempre bisogno di fare i conti e di farli con sempre maggiore consapevolezza e poi c'è la parola arte che fa da cappello un po' non solo a questo evento di oggi ma all'importanza all anche degli ospiti che abbiamo per celebrare questo Art Ethics, questo progetto biennale che nasce tra la fondazione Donna Regina per le arti contemporanee, Museo Madre di Napoli, eh, saluto la vicepresidente qui presente e la, e la presidente collegata eh, online Laura Valente e il nostro osservatorio Ethos, eh, qui rappresentato oltre che appunto dal suo ideatore, fondatore, eh, professore eh, Sebastiano Maffettone, che saluto con affetto e ringrazio per il gran lavoro che sta facendo in questa sua eh, terza vita, la più, la più ricca probabilmente, eh, dopo quella di professore ordinario, di, di rappresentante a vari livelli della nostra istituzione, e questa di, di come dire, alimentatore del nostro centro Ethos e forse la più, la più interessante per lui stesso e per noi e professor Riccio anche e ringrazio anche per la sua presenza per il lavoro che fa per, questa, per questo nostro osservatorio e il professor Maridoro che è qui oggi in un ruolo diciamo tecnico ma che lavora con Sebastiano al, al nostro osservatorio però come si dice eh, oltre che salutare e ringraziare con tanto affetto anche la professoressa eh, Francesca Maria Corrao che parteciperà al dibattito e che il nostro professore diciamo eh, sulla frontiera della, 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 delle questioni medio orientali, arabe, quindi saluto con molto affetto la professoressa Corrao e io sono proprio felice e orgoglioso invece di poter ringraziare per la eh, molto molto preziosa presenza per noi di eh, due personaggi molto importanti uno come dire noto, notissimo che ringrazio con molta, con, davvero con molto, con molto, ringraziando moltissimo, che ringrazio con molta enfasi, e il professor eh, Massimiliano Fuxas, che è eh, come dire, eh, uno dei più noti eh, rappresentanti del, dell'arte, del design, della, del genio italiano nel mondo, e quindi davvero grazie eh, a Massimiliano Fuxas per la sua presenza qui oggi e per essere con noi sulle traiettorie di Ethos e di ciò che Ethos potrà fare per il nostro Ateneo e per i ragazzi che entrano in contatto con il nostro Ateneo. E poi eh, la bellezza eh, si è capace di arricchirsi e di arricchirci sempre di più. E quindi oggi la parola bellezza per noi vuol dire avere ospite della nostra università Ibrahim Mahama, eh, artista ghanese che ringrazio moltissimo eh, per essere qui con noi oggi in Luis. Eh, e soprattutto per, per il messaggio che lui porterà nella nostra università eh, nella giornata in cui si avvia il progetto eh, Art Ethics 
ehm, per dare lì, lui soprattutto un significato pieno proprio alla parola eh, geografia e per farlo con la sua modalità di intendere l'arte utilizzando materiali umili desunti dalla realtà storica del paese in cui lui lavora mettendo al centro i temi che sono i temi nostri di oggi la globalizzazione che in realtà oggi eh, vede la sottolineatura della parola regional in maniera per noi sempre molto più interessante ma soprattutto le migrazioni e mh, il, il la creazione della comunità attraverso i materiali, l'umiltà e l'arte. Allora, io penso che eh, forse ho preso davvero molto più tempo di quanto non avrei dovuto e voluto, ma eh, è per dirvi che, eh, diciamo, questo è il modo in cui forse si può riempire eh, di contenuti reali eh, il, il, quello che, il concetto che abbiamo sentito troppe volte eh, raccontato anche prima del Covid, soprattutto prima del Covid, è cioè quello dell'umanesimo digitale. No? E abbiamo fin troppo ascoltato e partecipato a, a, a chiacchiere, convegni sul tema dell'umanesimo digitale e molte volte senza che chi ne parlava sapesse esattamente cosa umanesimo ha significato e cosa umanesimo può voler dire che non è esattamente mettere la persona al centro. Era, allora era mettere la riscoperta dei testi classici al centro, attraverso la capacità consapevole di conoscere i linguaggi, di, di sapere il latino e il greco e sapere andare a prendere l'opera da cui realmente eh, prendersi il messaggio del creatore di quell'opera. Ecco, per noi oggi eh, l'umanità vuol dire mettere le mani direttamente laddove nasce l'arte e lì c'è l'uomo e lì c'è la conoscenza attraverso il linguaggio più bello che l'uomo può avere, che è quello della creazione eh, artistica. Grazie Sebastiano, grazie a voi tutti per questo evento di oggi. Grazie direttore generale, grazie a tutti voi che siete in linea. Io cercherò molto brevemente di presentare con due fotografie e tre punti il senso del progetto Artetics. Prima di farlo però non posso esimermi da alcuni ringraziamenti. I primi ringraziamenti vanno alla mia università, alla LUIS. Credo che sia questa la prima volta in cui un evento artistico è preso sostanzialmente come il core di una di un evento Lewis. Cioè noi non facciamo vedere arte fatta altrove, ma cerchiamo di capire cosa fa l'arte con uno spirito che riguarda, con un'intenzione che riguarda la, i suoi aspetti sociali, politici e morali. Quindi l'intenzione con cui lo facciamo è molto coerente con i progetti da lui. Quindi ringrazio particolarmente il direttore generale, senza di cui questo progetto non sarebbe andato avanti, il rettore dell'università, il direttore della Business School Paolo Boccardelli. Ma... Ringrazio anche gli interventi che ci saranno di Massimiliano e Francesca, due cari amici, che non sono stati presi a caso solo perché sono due importanti personaggi della cultura italiana, ma Ibrahim è musulmano e credo che Francesca sia una delle persone che meglio di tutti in Italia capiscono che cosa vuol dire essere musulmani e il progetto di Ibrahim prevede anche una riconversione urbanistico-architettonica di locali dell'epoca di Gruma in Ghana, che è circa 50 anni fa, tra l'altro la prima volta in cui sono stato in Ghana. Quindi l'architetto Fuchs, da questo punto di vista, può avere una di quelle sue intuizioni e può dare un contributo non banale. Ma più di ogni altro, devo dire, e qui può entrare la prima foto, ringrazio, l'avrete riconosciuto, Laura e Catherine, e non potete non riconoscerlo voi, gli altri non lo so, ma voi. Questa è una delle sale... Era una sala clemente del Museo Mate di Napoli, un museo straordinario, azionato dalla Fondazione Donna Regina per le Arti Contemporanee, che fa, oltre che, essere, che oltre che essere un grande museo di arte contemporanea, fa un lavoro enorme sull'educazione, sulla ricerca, sul sociale, che io condivido in pieno. Ora, con la Presidente Laura Valente io non avevo dubbi di poter fare progetti assieme, la conoscevo da prima di questo progetto, abbiamo lavorato assieme e sono sicuro che partiamo da punti molto distanti l'uno dall'altro ma poi ci incontriamo sempre su un punto che di solito è migliore di quelli che avevamo all'inizio, quindi di questi non avevo molti dubbi. Però sono stato fortunato particolarmente perché nell'occasione ho conosciuto la nuova direttrice del museo, Catherine Weir, non so come si, come si dica bene, Weir, Weir, cosa, scusatemi se sbaglio la pronuncia, 
ma si sa, gli italiani sbagliano la pronuncia dei cognomi stranieri, una specie di regola. Comunque abbiamo trovato un compagno di strada, nel vero senso del termine. Io ho parlato a lungo con Catrin e quando gli ho esposto come vedevo io il progetto, invece di trovare una persona che si opponeva, trovavo una persona che era più d'accordo di me su quello che sostenevo io. Quindi sono molto entusiasta di tutto questo, come potete immaginare. E allora veniamo alla seconda foto che mi serve a spiegare il titolo. E questo è il secondo punto, sì. Ammesso, no, è il primo punto. Guardate questa foto, non so se si veda bene online, ma sostanzialmente... Questo è il centro di gravità del mondo. Cosa vuol dire centro di gravità del mondo? Che è il punto in cui statisticamente avvengono il nuovo, maggior numero di transazioni economiche, commerciali e politiche nel mondo. Se voi guardate, quando io avevo l'età di alcuni studenti o ex studenti, che sono, ex studenti da poco, che sono qui, diciamo 50 anni fa, il centro del mondo era dove lo sareste aspettato, cioè a metà tra Londra e New York in mezzo all'Atlantico. Non è un posto fisico, eh, perché non è che siamo su una barca in mezzo all'Atlantico, è semplicemente che considerando tutti i traffici commerciali ed economici del mondo e finanziari era tra Londra e New York, come tutti noi ce lo saremmo aspettato. Bene, adesso è quasi negli Urali. Pensate il cambiamento che ha fatto. La cosa ancora più interessante, come, se non altro come curiosità intellettuale, è che quello che avviene nel 2020 già avveniva intorno all'anno 1000. Quindi siamo ritornati a una fase storica in cui il centro del mondo sente molto il peso dell'Oriente. C'è l'Europa, allora non c'era l'America, adesso c'è l'America, ma nonostante questo il centro del mondo sente molto, non solo, ma le proiezioni ci dicono che per il 2050 si sposterà, si sposterà decisamente verso la Cina. Ora, tenete conto che questo centro del mondo, la foto è McKinsey, quindi una certa autorevolezza, e non è cinese quello che l'ha fatto. C'è pure un professore di Singapore che più o meno ha ottenuto gli stessi risultati, che si chiama Danny Qua, ma questa è puramente occidentale ed è fatta da McKinsey, quindi non ha pregiudizi pro-Oriente. Dicevo, nel 2050 si sposterà ancora più vicino alla Cina. La mappatura non tiene conto dell'Africa, non tiene conto abbastanza dell'Africa, Seguendo quanto dicono i tecnografi, è pensabile che non solo vada a est, ma un po' pure verso sud. Quindi avremo un mondo totalmente cambiato. Perché questo è importante? Perché il soft power, il potere intellettuale, il potere culturale, eccetera, eccetera, non può essere disgiunto dal potere economico. E prima o poi avremo un peso della cultura che viene da questa parte del mondo molto maggiore di quello a cui siamo abituati. Questo è, la prima, è il primo punto. Il secondo punto è un po' di storia che riguarda l'Africa. A febbraio del 2002 ho visto una mostra che non dimenticherò mai, era New York, Queens, la sede del PS1, la sede distaccata del MoMA, e c'era una mostra che si chiamava The Short Century, Independence and Liberation Movements in Africa, 1945-1994, quindi movimenti di dipendenza, Stato e arte, Stato e cultura. Si vedeva una cosa molto nitida, il periodo in cui c'è stato il colonialismo, ha condannato gli artisti africani al folklore. Tu sei africano, suona il tamburo, ecco, detto un po' volgarmente ovviamente, anzi molto volgarmente, ma insomma si capisce. Subito dopo, con la liberazione, dopo la seconda guerra mondiale, c'è stato un proliferare di localismi, senza una direzione, ognuno faceva più o meno quello che voleva. Dopo c'è stata un'egemonia occidentale in veste americana. Io ricorderò sempre che circa vent'anni fa, alla Biennale di Venezia, trovai che il padiglione coreano era quasi uguale al padiglione ungherese, non riuscivo a capire come, poi ci arrivai, erano tutti derivati di New York. E quindi c'è stato questo periodo, ora quello che ho detto prima e quello che tutti pensiamo è che questo periodo in età postcoloniale matura è finito. L'arte non sarà più una derivazione di New York sparsa per il mondo, non sarà più un'egemonia occidentale, ma ci sarà un proliferare. E la mia tesi è quella banale che ho di cui ho parlato in molti libri e in molti articoli, che noi dobbiamo cominciare a prendere sul serio l'idea che impariamo dagli altri. Nel modello standard, quello di quando io ero giovane, il professore di Harvard o di Oxford andava in India o in Cina e spiegava come si vive, come si dovrebbe vivere, come si fa a campare bene. Beh, questo non, non ha più senso. Ecco. Ogni idea che noi in Occidente 
Forse questo è più, a è più facile pensarlo a Napoli, che è una città borderline, ai limiti, nella provincia dell'impero. Ma comunque noi in Occidente non abbiamo un messaggio da mandare al resto del mondo senza parimenti prendere dal resto del mondo un messaggio altrettanto importante. Questa è l'essenza della nostra tesi. Perciò noi parliamo di arte, ma parlando di arte partiamo anche di storia, di geografia, di etica, di diritto e di politica, per non parlare dell'economia che ho citato prima. Bene, Ibrahim Ama, per diverse ragioni, è un embodiment, un, proprio un prendere corpo di questa idea, perché è nato a Temale in Gala nel 1987, beato a lui, è giovane, di grande successo, si è formato in Ghana. Questa è la molla che con Gianluca Ricci, insieme al quale abbiamo pensato queste cose qui in Etos, Luis, ci siamo mossi. Una formazione che non deve troppo all'Occidente, che tiene d'occhio l'Occidente, ma è autoctona e diventa globale. Quindi un altro modo di proporre l'arte. I materiali che usa sono materiali poveri, come diceva il direttore generale prima, sono materiali che sanno di Africa, ma i suoi progetti sono davvero imponenti e grandiosi. Ma a questo punto io mi taccio perché parlerà dopo lui, quello sarà senza nulla togliere gli interventi, dopo di me saranno Gianluca e Katrin, e poi, no, dopo di me sarà Laura, e poi Gianluca e Katrin, e poi... Ibrahim e poi ci saranno i commenti di Massimiliano e Francesca. Grazie. Vado? Mi sentite? Ti sentiamo, ti sentiamo Pronto? Laura, ti sentiamo. Ti sentiamo? Ti sentiamo? Sì, 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 allora, sì. scusate, perché mi, mi era scomparso il monitor. Allora, intanto io non voglio ripetere le cose che sono state già dette in maniera molto efficace prima di me, però permettetemi due ringraziamenti anch'io, ovviamente al mio CDA, al CDA della Fondazione Donna Regina per le Arti Contemporanee, Ferdinando Pinto e Maria Letizia Magaldi, la mia vicepresidente, che è lì con voi fisicamente oggi, perché da subito hanno sposato pienamente e in maniera molto appassionata questo progetto. E ovviamente la Regione Campania, che è il nostro socio fondatore. Eh, ringrazio Sebastiano, perché è, è ovviamente l'Osservatorio Etos della LUIS, tutta la dirigenza, il Rettore, il direttore generale Lo Storto che ha appena eh, parlato prima e non solo per averci ospitato oggi ma eh, per aver anche eh, sostenuto molto all'interno dell'osservatorio Etos che più di un anno fa eh, vedeva nascere questa idea speciale come l'ha chiamata Sebastiano eh, di eh, una in grande istituzione universitaria, un museo d'arte contemporanea che lavoravano attorno ad un concetto nuovo di sperimentazione artistica e di multiculturalità. Uh, tutto questo all'interno anche di tante domande che ci siamo fatti, cioè ci siamo chiesti nel, in questo anno e mezzo che preparavamo l'arrivo di Ibrahim, io sono felicissima che oggi la prima uscita pubblica di Ibrahim sia uh, battezzata da questo incontro, ciao Ibrahim e ovviamente ciao a tutti, ma... Mh, eh, All'interno di questo eh, percorso che iniziava appunto un anno e mezzo fa, tante volte ci siamo chiesti, eh, ci siamo fatti la domanda anche eh, delle domande altre, eh, cioè a cosa serve oggi un museo d'arte contemporanea, che cos'è un museo, cosa potrebbe essere un museo del futuro, a cosa serve un museo dell'oggi per poter pensare ad un museo del futuro, cioè un museo del presente che sta vivendo tantissimi cambiamenti e anche la rivoluzione eh, più importante, quella digitale, dopo quella eh, industriale. Ecco, un museo, secondo noi, capace di abbattere le pareti che separano il dentro dal fuori. In questo ci hanno aiutato molto e io mi sento davvero di ringraziarli sia Gianluca che è stato dall'inizio, ha battezzato il primo passo di questo processo, poi si è aggiunta la nostra direttrice artistica, Katrin Weir, che non solo lo ha sposato, ma addirittura a volte ci, ci scavalca a sinistra uh, nell'entusiasmo e nella voglia di, di traghettarlo verso approdi nuovi. Ecco, uh, questi due anni, questo anno e mezzo, e qui permettetemi l'ultimo ringraziamento, 
che va ad un amico speciale, ad una persona ancora più speciale e ad un grandissimo ricercatore e professore che è Sebastiano Maffettone, perché questa idea eh, anomala, tra virgolette, e a noi due piacciono molto eh, i progetti anomali, nasce proprio da eh, quello che io chiamo un pensiero lungo quello di non, no, di non accontentarsi della buccia e della prima catalogazione di genere, perché quello che noi ci auspichiamo, non solo con Ibrahim, ma partendo tutti insieme con Ibrahim, è di disegnare un, un museo del futuro che sia sempre più diffuso, attivo, condiviso, partecipato, solidale, sostenibile e aggiungo anche pieno di connessioni diverse e non solo digitali. Funziona? Sì, ok. Ciao Laura, grazie dell'intervento, bello. E io spenderò davvero poche parole e mi preme diciamo, aggiungermi questi tanti ringraziamenti che sono stati fatti, lo faccio con sincerità, Laura l'ha ricordato, è un percorso che parte da lontano e lungo questo percorso si sono incrociate tante esperienze, tanti incontri, Il, i primi ringraziamenti naturalmente sono per Sebastiano e Laura con cui abbiamo condiviso al principio il percorso, ma un grandissimo ringraziamento a Katrin Weir che mi dispiace moltissimo che non sia qui né lei né Laura e, e il ringraziamento oltre che a loro tre come compagni di viaggio di questo percorso che stiamo ancora conducendo e condividendo lo estendo, lo estendo alla Luis naturalmente che ci ospita qui che ci ha già ospitato in altre occasioni in qualche altra occasione per la presentazione dell'osservatorio Ethos abbiamo fatto qualche piccola pillola in cui Artetix è stata presentata, ma lo faccio anche alle altre persone che insieme a noi ci affiancano in questo percorso. Penso al Museo Madre, in particolar modo, con cui ho diciamo, avuto una storia, una conoscenza che parte anche dagli anni addietro. Qui c'è Letizia, mi fa molto piacere che sia venuta, la vicepresidente della Fondazione Donna Regina. E, e le altre persone che in questo diciamo, progetto ci stanno affiancando, penso a Laura Mariano, penso ad Anna Cuomo, che sono delle persone che insieme a noi e insieme ad Ibrahim hanno diciamo, costruito questo processo di residenza che Ibrahim ha compiuto a Napoli, con Arianna Rosica che è, ci sta supportando in tanti aspetti centrali, non solo riguardanti la comunicazione, Patrizia Renzi, insomma c'è tanta gente che sta lavorando intorno a tutto ciò. E a me diciamo, preme molto ringraziarle tutte e, um, e ringraziare naturalmente gli ospiti che sono qui con noi, l'architetto Fuxas, è un grande piacere, seppur a distanza, averlo qui, la professoressa Corrao e sono sicuro che sarà... Molto interessante diciamo, il discorso che faremo e naturalmente il più, il più grosso ringraziamento va, va a Ibrahim che è qui accanto a me. E credo come ci siamo detti con Laura, Katrin in questi giorni sia un po' un miracolo che Ibrahim sia riuscito ad arrivare, che sia riuscito a conoscere Napoli che era una città che non conosceva e che questo progetto come dire, si sia fisicamente costruito in questi tempi così complessi come quelli che stiamo attraversando. Il mio microfono ogni tanto va, non va? Ok. E sono felicissimo che Ibrahim sia qui, che abbiamo condiviso con questa esperienza che avrà ancora un po' di tempo. E le poche parole che voglio spendere riguardano diciamo, la, la ragione. Sebastiano e Laura hanno già parlato di Artetics, il senso che questa operazione ha. È un'operazione molto inedita, anche in una certa misura, questa connessione tra un, cerchio di, un centro di ricerca universitaria così prestigioso come la LUIS e come l'osservatorio Ethos all'interno della LUIS e il Museo Madre, come uno dei più importanti musei d'arte contemporanea italiana, è un'esperienza innovativa da un certo punto di vista. E, e, ma è, diciamo, la ragione per cui Ibrahim è qui, è, secondo me, si connette in modo profondo con le ragioni sostanziali che hanno mosso 
ethos ed artetics come una sua costola perché la ricerca di Ibrahim è inutile che io ricordi che è uno dei più importanti artisti della scena africana a livello internazionale ormai incarna in pieno come Sebastiano sosteneva lo spirito di ethos e lo fa in una misura non solo coinvolgente da un punto di vista estetico ma anche eh, più complesso e se dovessi pensare a una formula per sintetizzare diciamo, l'importanza, la ragion d'essere della presenza di Ibrahim qui e per come il suo lavoro diciamo, può contribuire eh, attraverso la sua ricerca artistica a offrirci un nuovo punto di vista intorno alla realtà che viviamo e a che abitiamo, uno sguardo eh, importante in questa direzione e anche una pratica artistica e estetica che non solo rappresenti un punto di vista inedito, nuovo, ma anche una pratica artistica dedita a un diciamo, indicare delle possibilità di cambiamento che le sfide che abbiamo davanti ci, ci presentano. Oggi, e chiudo, pensavo ad una formula retorica che spesso si usa, si è usata, cioè l'idea di coprire le distanze. Mai come oggi no? ci troviamo distanti ma vicini, mai come oggi il mondo digitale ci ha abituati a coprirla questa traiettoria, ma al tempo stesso mai come oggi siamo come dire, anche divisi, eh, non solo fisicamente ma anche economicamente, globalmente, mai come oggi quindi questa necessità di coprire le distanze appare più urgente perché più prossima, più vicina, perché ci vede tutti all'interno di questa necessità. E coprire le distanze, come Sebastiano diceva, significa oggi abituarsi, disporsi in un'ottica non solo di ascolto, ma di capacità di comprensione eh, verso diciamo, punti di vista altri rispetto diciamo, all'Occidente e capacità di dar vita a delle pratiche che in realtà queste distanze non solo le coprano ma siano in grado di rimodularle, ripensarle, ecco, ripensare il presente, ripensare le distanze che ci hanno separato e continuano a separarci penso sia una delle necessità più stringenti che ci dobbiamo trovare ad affrontare come sfida e credo che l'arte, la ricerca artistica, la cultura visuale per ciò che mi riguarda più direttamente, il percorso di Ibrahim siano estremamente diciamo necessarie e importanti in questa direzione. Mi fermo, passo la parola a Katrin Weyer, direttrice artistica del Museo Madre, curatrice con me del progetto di Ibrahim, sono felice di ascoltarla anche attraverso uno schermo, ma è una distanza che copriremo oggi. Grazie. Thank you Gianluca very much and thank you to everyone for being here together today. Um, at a distance, but feeling very much each other's presence. First of all, I would like to thank Ibrahim very much for sitting through uh, this uh, first section in Italian and the proceedings from now on will move into English. So I will also just say quickly my warm thanks to the Lewis University for hosting the event today and uh, very warm thanks to Sebastiano Maffettone and Laura Valente for their conception of the Art Ethics Project. That is the framework within which Gianluca and I are working today with Ibrahim on a major project for the Madre Museum um, that has allowed us to bring him in this period on a residency to Naples and uh, today to visit the Lewis in Rome. I will keep my comments very brief, so, but there will be a dis chance for discussion afterwards. Um, so just to say also thank you, um, as did Gianluca, uh, to all of those who are contributing to the project uh, from the staff of the Madre Museums and the Lewis University and all of those um, surrounding Ibrahim as well, because the, it's a project with a very uh, broad um uh, brief it's that comes at the culminating point of a whole period of his work there's this widespread perception of ibrahim mahama as the architecture and coco sax guy and yet this focus on forms and materials really doesn't get anywhere near the heart of what enlivens his practice he's interested in what architectural 
and technological forms may carry within them in terms of ideological visions, value systems, even cosmological frameworks. Um, so it is you know, very uh, appropriate to be in this context of the um, uh, considerations of the ethical unit of the Lewis University in relation to art and and uh, Sebastiano's comments kind of opened the evening speaking about the very strong relationship today between art practice like Ibrahim's and considerations of values and ethics. Uh, so through this interest in material forms in architecture and technology, uh, his practice is looking at where we come from historically, where we find ourselves in relation to, to this today, and how this history may help us to decide where we want to go now. So it is the most socially engaged and politically engaged practice possible. He'll speak today, as I mentioned, about this major um, six-year project, the Parliament of Ghosts, which has been developed within a a particular historical perspective uh, looking at post-independence Ghana and has been informing really now all of his practice moving forward and the project with us also in the art ethics framework. I think this movement from particular histories and rooted situated knowledges to how the tools and strategies that are developed can be shared and compared across geographical spaces is also integral to Ibrahim's work. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to him now. He is who we've all been waiting for. And then we look forward very much also to having a chance to ask questions and discuss afterwards. Thank you, Ibrahim. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for the, yeah, I always find that Italians give very, very brief <laughs> introductions. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Catherine, Gianluca, Sebastian, uh, Laura, uh, to the Louis uh, University, and everyone that has made it possible. It uh, almost seems each day I wake up, I don't, yeah, I can't believe that I still travel to Italy in this time because um, when the pandemic started, there, there was a joke um, in Ghana because a lot of Ghanaians uh, live in uh, a lot of Ghanaians live in uh, Italy, and uh, people each time family members travel, they always hope that someone would bring them presents back from Italy. But because of the pandemic in the beginning, suddenly no one wanted to receive any presents from Italy. So when I told uh, my family I was coming to Italy, they were a bit hesitant, but <laughs> I told them everything is okay. It's going to be fine. And so I'm really happy that I was able to make it. I guess today I'm just, um, uh, as um, um, Sebastian said, I think it's very important that we are able to somehow connect between art the framework of art and also like, uh, like for instance, the business school and also issues regarding economics and also people who study economics. Because I think there is always some kind of uh, a disconnect between uh, the realities of the world in terms of the conditions that are embodied within it. And secondly, um, for instance, those who make the policies and all that. Uh, but I think like when it comes to aesthetics and material conditions, the world operates at a very different level. So I try as much as possible within my work to raise those uh, questions through the projects that I do. I will start, uh, uh, I will start the, uh, maybe the talk or presentation with an image on the screen, which is uh, a drone footage uh, image that I took of a building in Ghana in the eastern side. It's a silo. So it's a, uh, it's a food storage uh, building. It was built in between the 60s and 1966 by Eastern European architects as part of this massive social infrastructure program, which was uh, uh, initiated by our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, to be able to store food. Um, 
of course, there were so many of these buildings that were built around Ghana, but they were never completed. Um, so, because after 1966, when the coup happened with Nkrumah, there were a series of coups that happened. So I've always felt that the kind of ideological premise that we started, that the post-independent Ghana was born with, was somehow lost in transition. So I'm very much interested in that as a starting point as an artist, to be able to ask questions that somehow throw us back into time and to be able to relate to some things. They, I, it's, it's a collage, so there are two uh, layers of the image. The first, uh, the one on top, is um, a, a notes from a pupil's book in Ghana. So for instance, when children go to school and they have to study, um, it's something as common as uh, what a non-living thing is. So what is a non-living thing? Uh, and the student writes, a non-living thing uh, does not make babies, does not eat, rest, um, blah, blah, blah. But I think that these buildings are living things because um, they somehow, because they've accumulated a certain sense of history, they speak to us in very different forms. Um, when these buildings were abandoned, they were being occupied by all kinds of uh, living things like um, birds, snakes, fishes, bats. And I think that the ecosystem that was created within the space somehow really changed what the, what the building became. So I started imagine, uh, looking at it almost as if it was some kind of a portal. So if it, was, uh, if it was structured as if it was the universe, you will be able to move from one space to the other in all the different holes that presents within it. And of course, uh, the practice that I have comes from uh, the, yeah, my interest in the body and the conditions that it presents from uh, art school and looking at the relationship between the cocoa sac, which is uh, originally produced in India and brought to Africa for the exportation of uh, cocoa beans. The cocoa beans that end up in these bags are the beans that were supposed to have been stored in these massive structures, the silos, that were never completed. So I'm always very much interested in the, what this material actually represents within the contemporary time that we live in, in relation to the current state of globalization, and also, in rela uh, and also the buildings, those buildings that I'm currently dealing with, with regards to the silos, and what they propose to us. There are two different timelines in a way, and I'm more or less interested as an artist ways in which we can bring these together. Um, of course, I'm also very much interested in the history of labor. So railway workers around the world, and also from Ghana, like those who really contributed significantly to the building and also the, the fixing of the infrastructure that somehow really helped in like the economy. Um, uh, there are three uh, projects that I will be showing throughout the presentation. So this is uh, just a um, Google image of my city, Tamale, where I live, and where these projects are uh, located. One which is called Red Clay, which is a, an artist studio which I created in the last six years uh, for expanding the conversation around contemporary art. And then the other one, which is SCCA, Savannah Center for Contemporary Art, which was also founded as a way to go back in time to look at artistic practices and to be able to recontextualize them. And the last one, which is uh, uh, one of the silos which I recently acquired from the States in order to be able to uh, do some kind of time travel. Yeah, so these, some of these are just uh, images from the institutions in terms of exhibitions that we are currently having um, within our different spaces. So this was the last, uh, the, the most recent exhibition that we opened in uh, September, which is of a Ghanaian artist, uh, Ajimano Se. So the exhibition was looking at 20 to 30 years of his artistic practice. I think it's very important to be able to create spaces like this because I think more now more than ever within our generation, we need to somehow reinforce the value of creating very strong institutions, institutions that propose different ways in which art can be perceived rather than the one that we inherited. Because when I was growing up as an artist, I didn't have these kinds of experiences, having these kinds of spaces to be able to experience art. But I think that it's important somehow to be able to go back in time and to be able to somehow uh, have a different sense of dialogue with what the history of art has been.
So this is the third space, which is this silo. So this is a very different version of the first one that I showed because this doesn't have the weight of the concrete, the top, the silo itself, but it does something differently later on when I show them. And I'm, I was also very much interested in just the inside of these buildings. What happens, they are these, they're almost like um, these small holes which originally, if the silo is complete and the grains are poured into it, they are connected with these machines and that's where they are, they are, they are, they are poured out. But because they are not completed in very different stages, um, when you look through the hole, you see, like it, it creates a very different kind of frame in each of them across in like different geographical locations. So the one which is in Tamale, which was the top was never built. When you look through it, you just see the plain sky. Uh, one which is in Ho, you see the octagonal shape with if there's a bird passing by or plane, you might see it in a frame. And the one in Accra, it's, uh, you just see lights coming through because that's, the top part was decked. So I'm really interested in what happens when you take the same, even the same building across different spaces and you look through it through a certain lens, how that shifts or how that creates a very different narrative. So um, some of these are images of um, collaborators, people I've worked with inhabiting very, various social conditions within the states. Uh, like uh, young women who travel, who migrate from like rural areas to the city centers to do all kinds of odd jobs. But I've always thought that those were somehow very problematic because we have to find ways in which we can eradicate these kinds of migrations. And um, there are many contradictions that are posed within capital, but when we are talking about it within a pure economic terms, sometimes a lot of these things are ignored because the because, as I said in the beginning, the condition, the prevailing uh, uh, social conditions are always somehow um, uh, not taken into account. Yeah, so, um, yeah, cr trying to, in my work, trying to create all kinds of various dialogues uh, between the body and maps, uh, uh, yeah, residues within trains, um, that's where maybe discarded or destroyed. So I like these kinds of relations to be able to remind us of the situation that we find ourselves in within the 21st century. So, and I collect a lot of things. So most of these images are each like maps and other materials that I've collected over the time. Uh, in relation also to the parliament, the concept of the parliament of ghosts, like using the residues and somehow the misplaced values, ideological values, and everything in history to be able to start a parliament that gives us a very different uh, starting point of re-looking at the world that we find ourselves in today. Yeah. And some of these materials are probably materials that would have never been re-encountered again, but through art, it gives us a very different lens to be able to look at it again. And also, some of the images, like going back into like, uh, some of the old colonial images of like trains, which were brought to Africa for like, the, uh, the colonial exploits. And it's sometimes, aside the narrative, I'm also very much interested in the image itself. It looks very futuristic in a way, like the idea of a train suspending in the air. I remember uh, one of the projects that uh, I think it was Jeff Koons that he proposed some time ago was using, uh, somehow suspending this train before. But of course, I'm, uh, just the idea of what this image is, it's, it's somehow in my practice, it inspired me to be able to think or to conceive new imaginations. Um, um, so I spent a lot of time at the railways looking at um, the old trains there and what they could become, how we could salvage materials from it in the building of the parliament and blah, blah, blah. Um, focusing a lot on the work, the labor that goes there, the workers within the area because as an artist, I spend a lot of time going from site to site photographing spaces, not because I don't really have anything to do, but I think it's important to um, pay attention to the issue of work, particularly in the, in the century that we find ourselves in. Because when each time we're talking about inequalities, 
and uh, work has not been paid the right wages and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot that is not taken into account. So I like to be able to somehow uh, uh, witness these and also witness how space changes over time. So this is the same space in two different timelines. But it's because each I, when I revisit spaces again and again, just to see what they are, at different points, they present different uh, images. Um, different uh, structures, like um, affordable housing buildings, built, abandoned, uh, at different stages, looking at them almost as these, uh, as I was talking about, like in, again, like time, almost like these time machines, I look at them, yeah, as such they present very different ways of looking at the same yeah image so yeah so they look futuristic but these are old yeah but it's the yeah the perspective at which we come into it so proposing new ways in which we can look at these uh, spaces and what they can do for the generations that are yet to emerge um, looking at archives that ordinarily would be not used or abandoned um, trying to collect materials that can be used to rebuild a new image of what a future is, but they're mostly materials that are like, let's say, 150 years old or more. Looking at the contradictions that are posed within these spaces, uh, food growing through the train, yeah. Ordinarily, the train would have been a place where <laughs> they would pour the beans in, which would somehow go to the port and go off. But yeah, like these, uh, for me, these are important to look at. Um, um, inhabiting the space itself and producing work within it, like some of the occupation series, early works that I did covering buildings, like in Milan at the Porta Venezia. Um, it's important to note that this is how the work sometimes is produced within these spaces. So when you see stains within the work, I think it comes as a result of picking up the physical stains and realities within the historical spaces as they are. Um, yeah, so some of these are they're looking at spaces, what they present. So the Parliament of Ghosts, looking at drawings, things, uh, processes that I go through. Um, um, the, the, the studio in Tamale, Red Clay, I, when I proposed the Parliament of Ghosts for uh, Manchester um, in 2009, no, before, two years before that, but when the work was done in 2019, it was quite interesting that, um, you know, as an African artist, when we have, uh, <laughs> Yeah, there is always an opportunity to travel around the world and to propose ideas and to do very big projects and very big museums. But for me, the question has always also been that how can we as artists be able to turn the conversation around by producing work within the local context that somehow change the very perception and notion of art? Because for me, it's not just about the object going off, but it's also about the experience, you know. So in uh, Manchester, like any other museum, for instance, this room, it's a space where you build the work in. But I am also interested in building the work into the, into the ground. It's almost as if we're doing some kind of an archaeological excavation. Um, but I also like how maybe uh, we can draw certain relations to, let's say, modernism, maybe looking at works by Robert Smithson, Anna Mendieta, and others. But I'm also much interested in going back into this timeline and what this work within this age actually proposes. So this is the, orig the image from the Withworth at, uh, in Manchester. So uh, these were areas where I collected the seats from. So the parliament was basically constructed out of the old train seats that were used during the colonial times and post-independence. So uh, photographing the process uh, of changing the parliament growing, taking a different form. And I think that as I spoke about ideologically, I think it's very important, at least for artists and practitioners uh, within the continent and within a generation to really understand the significance of what the power of art and the agency and also the responsibility that it comes with being an artist. When you call yourself an artist, it's not just to make <laughs> Uh, paintings or sculptures or installations or photographs, but it's somehow to take control of a certain, uh, the social fabric and to be able to somehow 
uh, turn it around in various multiple perspectives. Um, yeah, so um, these are just basic drone images of the the parliament. It's still in uh, it's still in the process of building. Um, so yeah, some drawings. Um, thinking about it in a very, I think about it's 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 purely an artwork in as much as it's architectural. So I draw the building as I build. Um, so yeah, and most of this work was actually done during the Corona lockdown. So <laughs> because we didn't really have much of a case as it was in Italy, so there was a lot of freedom, and I took advantage of it. This is an important image for me because um, there is. Um, when during when we were building, it was also raining a lot, and because of the way the structure is built, each time it rains, the building collects water, and the kids within the rural area just come and play within it. So it's quite interesting that if you were building, for instance, in Rome or in New York or in uh, in uh, in uh, in London, like in a building, a museum, and it's raining, like even no one is allowed inside. But I'm interested in how like the idea of uh, seriousness, like building, let's say, a parliament or any other structure with workers pouring concrete. And at the same time, maybe there is a water body within the structure and then kids playing within it. Uh, I think sometimes maybe we get too serious, so we, it doesn't really allow us to see maybe the, the beauty in life and how we can be able to transcend some of the issues that we're dealing with. So I thought the, the play of uh, the pool, the introduction of the pool within the parliament was very um, uh, significant in a way. Um, yeah, in a way that uh, allows for the, the generation that are going to inherit this to somehow experience it in, uh, as, it's, as, it's, as it's been built. Yeah, so this was um, yeah, the, the, when we opened the last exhibition. So you see there is a, a, a pond in the middle with water lilies, and it was inspired by the image of the kids playing in it, because the artist that we showed, who is a painter, he's always painted his water lilies. So it somehow inspired us to think that we could introduce the water lilies in the, in the exhibition. Yeah, so uh, these are still images of it um, from that period. Yeah, so um, the, the, the parliament doesn't just end with the physical building. It also ends with the idea that maybe we can be able to rescue maybe old technological forms and we can be able to transform and use them in different ways. So in my work, I've gone on to intervene by collecting old airplanes which were abandoned and be able to use them as classrooms maybe to be able to teach other technological things like drone tech and all that. Um, um, physically uh, tracing the transportation of these things across, let's say, a, a geographical landscape to where the studio is. Uh, thinking about uh, the various multiple spaces and let's say space travel and all that and how these things can also be implicated within the way we think now. Um, yeah, so this was one of the images of uh, transporting this old airplane which crashed at an, crash landed at an airport near my city. And um, just physically moving it from the, on the road um, <laughs> across, it, was, it seemed very stupid, but I guess that's what artists sometimes we have to do. Just a bit of stupidity maybe might be able to <laughs> allow us to leap certain things. Uh, and yeah, so I was taking photographs of like the kids coming to the roadside, schools. Yeah, and it's an image that probably they would have, they, 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 we will never ever see again in our lifetime. Maybe there's an apocalypse in the next 1,000 or 2,000 years. And this, with, between now and then, this image will never ever be produced again. So for me, the responsibility of the image is very important. And in terms of what it leaves, that, that stain or mark that it leaves in their heads, it's very important. So this is the red clay, what it was in the beginning, and being able to transform or change it into this uh, institutional complex, which um, allows for the planes to exist and all the other spaces um, that we can use for 
Yeah, so uh, this is an image of uh, Scampia, uh, the, one of the, yeah, so I wanted to show it because uh, one of the, as part of the project that I'm doing for the Madra, I was thinking about creating a work that somehow dialogues between the institution and also spaces that um, exist outside the framework of the institution. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, all these images of um, um, creating this relationship or dialogue between, let's say, these uh, machines and, let's say, architecture, for me, is very, very, very important. Um, being able to use the cockpits as a place to be able to create new ideas, because ordinarily, even as people who travel, we never really get access to these spaces. But to be able to use it as a classroom, to be able to like go back in time, to be able to, uh, yeah. Sometimes people think that, because I come from a, a very heavy background of uh, painting, because my undergrad to my PhD was is all in painting. But when you are showing images like this, it almost seems as if you are not interested in painting. But I think it's somehow very disrespectful to the history and legacy of painting if we think that we can reduce it just down to the canvas. I think that the, the social fabric and the conditions surrounding the representation, which has been ignored for a long time, is something that we need to be able to uh, expand on significantly. So this image, for instance, is um, some of the, like one of my colleagues at the institution uh, whom I taught the drone tech, uh, who is also teaching the kids in the community. Now, to be able to combine the old, for instance, the technology of the old airplanes and uh, using the airplanes as classrooms to teach them, some of the kids can now maybe teach other kids um, in the local language. So for me, it's very important that to be able to arrive at this point where you are able to, it's almost, it's a gift in a way, to be able to present them with this gift that the way they experience the world and think about the world and their place in the world changes completely. Um, as in relation to, let's say, just creating a, a modern art museum, which is just there, but to be able to use it as a framework to change the existing relations and all that, uh, to be um, looking at these buildings and thinking of how to convert them into greenhouses and the contradictions that pose between what is below and what is uh, above. Yeah, so I'll go up. Uh, so this is the silo from a different perspective. So different ones across the country in different positions. Um, different elements, assignments given to the students, how to, uh, basic idea of time and what that what does, that does to the idea of uh, an image or our, our experience of the world in a way. Um, so these, some of these are just, um, yeah, so I, it, for me the question of looking at how we experience the object or something is very important. So I have my skeleton man there uh, within, inside, above, <laughs> and outside the silo, trying to understand what it means to be able to occupy uh, space. And uh, one of the ideas that I was working with was to be able to intervene within these structures in a way that could create new spaces. For instance, creating uh, an independent art academy or aside creating, let's say, art institutions. Uh, converting some of the trains into, let's say, aquariums or marine spaces, because already that happens. Um, so, yeah, so some of these are just important because they are locally, like some of the people I work with at home, to be able to do some of these interventions, like uh, in the silo, when I, I had a chance to acquire the silo in Tamale. Uh, working with the local men to be able to like uh, do small interventions, sealing certain holes that would allow for the building to be uh, re-looked at and reworked. Um, yeah, so, and it's interesting because this building, since it was, uh, they, they, they stopped building it in 1966, no one had ever gone underneath it, underground, because no one really knew what was there. And there was a myth around it that, our first president had built it as some kind of a, 
um, a prison. <laughs> so, and everyone believed because why would you build a building like this? Because they were built by Eastern European architects and we are very much aware of how they were building at the time, heavy concrete and all that. So I was very much interested in what these myths were and how they could, it could allow us to be able to, let's say, access the building in a very different way. So building bridges within it, uh, drawing water, um, excavating uh, the space, because there was a lot of sand that was poured into the building just to seal it off over a long time. So to be able to get access to it, it was almost as if discovering Pompeii and excavating it uh, after many, many years or centuries. So, uh, and some of these, when you look at them in isolation, it could look like an image from anywhere. It could look like a gold mine or, but it's, uh, but it, it's interesting to me because we are somehow trying to, uh, we're somehow trying to dig through history in order to propose new futures. And for me, that is very important, uh, the labor factor that goes into it and what these people contribute. Um, multiple, multiple layers of spaces uh, underneath these. Uh, so these are the last images. So it comes back down also to the framework of art in itself, because uh, when, we, when the institution was founded, the, the, my colleagues from the university, both artists and professors, were contributing a lot of their own labor to the, to the, uh, to the realization of exhibitions and other forms that we're doing there. Um, and the whole idea was to be able to create through all the many projects that I've presented in the last uh, minutes, to be able to create an experience that allows for a different generation to access not just art, but also space in a very different way. Because uh, when you take these school kids through, let's say, the silo, uh, or and through the airplanes, and through the exhibition spaces, the multiplicity of spaces and how they function, maybe in a similar way or different way, it always triggers things within their minds. And for me, I think that is very important for us to be able to restructure what an educational system or model can be within the century that we find ourselves in. So some of my colleagues who were also artists who trained at the university would use, let's say, their artistic background to be able to run workshops teaching these children how to uh, paint or draw but um, the building is not a drawing or a work of art that you can buy or the silo is not something you can buy though i have bought it but that's where the contradiction lies that uh, through the contradiction of capital like using the residue of the sack which is uh, which once contained let's say cocoa which uh, was used in building, let's say, the silo, which the silo was abandoned, and then now the sack uh, used over years and then becoming something frail, almost thrown away, and using it to produce an artwork. And then it goes through the market system of valuation and uh, generates a new kind of capital. And that capital is used, let's say, in building these institutions, buying the airplanes, creating this program. And with the same capital again, with a combination of these projects, using it as a way to renegotiate with the state in order to be able to acquire certain historical spaces, to be able to uh, make them public again. The things which were once supposed to be common, that were supposed to propose new f uh, futures that were lost, we can now inhabit them again to propose new futures. But it's important to remember that they are not the same things as they were before. The silo which was built to contain the cocoa is not the same silo which I have inherited. The silo which I have inherited now deals with certain ecological forms and also the ecological crisis that we've inherited that if we don't take care, we might, fo uh, we might not be able to see it. Yeah, it's very easy that it can escape us. So for me, the point of not being able to lose uh, that sight is very important. So the sensitivity that comes with, um, and the, the sensitivity and also the attitude that comes with being able to think as an artist, particularly in this age that we live in, is uh, one which is very important to me. Um, yeah, so yeah, just it creates a sense of new culture. This is the in last image, a new culture. 
This um, image uh, which I end with is, um, I took this picture, I think it's uh, from 2011. So this is one of the first images when I started going in the market spaces because as an art student, of course in school, uh, I had a mentor, a professor, who was encouraging us a lot to experiment, find new forms, new spaces, because it, within art, history, art history framework, artists would go, would take inspiration from market spaces and paint the market women. Yeah, but we are more interested in how we can go into these spaces and how we can somehow uh, intervene within this, like the framework itself. So the contradictions that I was talking about in itself. So these are new sacks that I would collect from the warehouses and bring there in exchange for the old bags which have been used to create all these things. So from 2011 till now, all the projects that I've shown, the silo and everything, is produced out of an image like this. So for instance, when you see this, you necessarily do not think about the institutions that have created or built. But I think that that's what I was talking about, the idea to be able to acknowledge these spaces, the labor that goes into the world. Um, we've seen the right of uh, the right wing, because people are always, when there's always a crisis and people have to migrate, people are always meant to believe that there are other people coming in to take their jobs away from them. But they do not realize that it's because of the inad inadequacies of the system to be able to give them the right wages that gives them the problems that they do in, in habit. Um, so for me, it's very important to be able to, it's a moment of reflection within the time that we find ourselves in, to relook at the world much more critically and to be able to find um, a certain, yeah, maybe a new kind of discourse or form that can somehow be able to um, deal with the, the injustices that we, if we have inherited and somehow uh, propose um, new degrees of freedom for the, rest of our, for the rest of the world. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ibrahim. I know that you are not only a great artist, but also a great photographer. <laughs> and I pass the parola with great pleasure to the architect Fuxas. And we are here. Non la sentiamo, non la sentiamo. It's okay. No, it's okay. Sentiamo adesso, sentiamo. Adesso sì. Bene. Oh. Oh. Ecco. I want only to point to which language, official language, is English, Italian, or Roman, or Napolitan, which is the language, official language. I think English should be... <laughs> English is okay. It's okay, it's okay. Then, uh, perhaps you know, uh, I will speak only five minutes because it's better that you speak much more than me, of course. I think that uh, perhaps you know, but I think that you don't know, in 2000, I was the director of Biennale of Venice, and uh, I prepared this Biennale, it was a really complex Biennale, in two years. And, uh, in 1998, I decided the, the title, the mood of this Biennale, that could be, it was, less aesthetics, more ethics. Many of my colleagues, distinguished colleagues, they were a little bit uh, disappointed, because what is uh, less aesthetics? Uh, more ethics. Why? Let's 
the sense is not against, the head is why not. But then, anyway, I propose a tool, uh, perhaps 120 architects that I invite mm -hmm. from over all the world, even Africa and in Venice, to think, to, to have some idea about what is ethics in art, in the culture, in architecture. Then uh, the majority uh, did the normal projects. And so there are a few one to start to do something else. Was many people from uh, uh, Oriental, from uh, China, Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from uh, Middle East, people that were never in one Vietnam before. And these people was thinking more of what is uh, the, the differences in the world. And in one big part of it is Biennale, that is, uh, uh, we call this uh, the Cordelier, this is 300 meters long. I propose one screen with the Studio Azzurro. And this big screen, was what happened in the world in front of this face, this screen, were the athletes. And the screen uh, proposed something uh, very new in the time uh, to have a continuity of image from an airplane. And in 300 meters, they are flying, or some people that are going, the immigrants, or was some disaster or something. The main disaster was uh, in Africa. Because of what I understood from uh, Ibrahim was this nature and building, something that doesn't work together. You have many ruins of European architecture or colonial architecture, like science, like station, like point that you take image. And, uh, but you have even ruins, natural ruins. There is not the ruins only of building, but these uh, ruins even of nature. Then uh, in this uh, image, this uh, way to speak that we have, you have, I have seen that this, uh, the world that uh, I, I keep, it was injustice, injustice. What is injustice? It's annoying for us, for us. Something against the human, the human being, against us. What I understood is that there are today could be only a part of our critic. It is another world. One of the last, you say, critical, critic. Art could be critic, architecture could be critic. Architecture is part of art, art is part of architecture. Cinema, movie are always the same thing. I, have no, I don't distinguish any, any of these different way to expression. Because the, the, this kind of differences between this expression belong to Illuminism, to something they want to make clear, to make simple, something very complex. And now in this period, in the pandemic period, we understood that it is more complex than we were thinking. And we cannot make simple. And when we try to make simple, everything is against us. We are against the nature, and the nature is against us. I think Ibrahim is a, it's a part of the, this new culture, very strong, that is completely out of this culture. Like my friend, my friend Mafetone say, that is very far away from New York. And from New York, we are all far away now, still. Eight or nine months ago, we were always looking to New York. Now we complain New York. And New York complain us. And all together, 
all these people of West countries, and the West countries are no more than 700 million, and all the world are 8 billion of people. Now we understand that we have to start again, not to cancel, to forget, and say we don't want to make the same things. Like I said, 22 years ago, that I didn't want to be the artist like what I was before, and like many artists want to be. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to hear Ibrahim. Uh, thank you very much for people that invited Ibrahim in Naples and now in Rome. Thank you very much to everybody. I kiss you all. Grazie, grazie a lei, architetto, per essere stato con noi oggi, davvero. È stato un piacere. E, um, passerei subito la parola alla professoressa Corrao, che è stata così gentile da aspettarci. E la saluto e lascio a lei la parola. Non la sentiamo, anche lei la vediamo o non la sentiamo? Okay. No. Okay, now, okay. can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. So, thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here with you, and uh, I really um, appreciate very much uh, this event. Uh, I, I had my, my speech prepared in, in Italian, but I will switch it to in English because uh, it would be better to speak in a way that Ibrahim could follow me, uh, as uh, I had the, the chance in my life to be part of a, of a project of rebuilding a city that had been destroyed by the earthquake, which is Gibellina in uh, in Sicily, and where Burri uh, uh, created a, a huge sculpture out of uh, the uh, uh, of the city that had been destroyed by the earthquake. Uh, so in this rebuilding, this, this uh, operation of uh, re revitalize uh, something that has been lost and had the, gone through uh, layers uh, of uh, re-burning again uh, because uh, plants were uh, destroying the shape of the place is something not so far in principle uh, from the images that you showed us. And, uh, and in fact, while looking at your uh, works, uh, preparing myself to welcome you, I found uh, many similarities with Burri because uh, as you use this very poor material uh, and you take it from the place where you were, exactly as he did with this poor material and he transformed. And in the same time, you are giving new spirituality to, uh, to the objects. And that gives a sense of profound uh, hope uh, in the sense that uh, whoever look at it feels the possibility of transforming reality. And this is the message you give to, to the kids and this is, in fact, what the, my foundation as the MAMA Foundation is also doing you now, to teach to, to the kids, to give uh, to the students this possibility uh, to be attentive uh, to how you can create out of nothing, out of uh, uh, rubs, uh, and, um, and be full of irony. And that is a fantastic, because... You cannot always take yourself, you, no, you, yourself, not you, I mean, yourself, generally speaking, uh, too much seriously, because life is full of contradiction. And out of contradiction, you create something new. And this is, this is the miracle of art. I remember uh, a great friend of Maffetone and me, Adonis, he would say, uh, the role of the artist is to look at contradictions and indicate not solution, but just uh, another another way, a way to get out from that and going beyond the contradiction in a positive way, in a creative way. And this is in fact what you do uh, when you uh, yeah, you created that beautiful uh, work of art uh, at the Maxi, I think it was last year or two years ago with the sewing machines, where you had no people, but just sewing machines and, and noise. 
Well, I noticed that there were no people. That is the, the idea of the ghost, the idea of a capitalism who has no feeling for human beings who are cre creating all this value, all this wealth, all this richness. No gratitude. While throughout your works, it is full with gratitude to all the efforts normal human beings are doing. And this is the great message. And this is what exactly Los Torto was saying at the very beginning of our meeting today. Uh, that is real humanism, to start from human being. Hmm? And um, another very interesting thing is, is the dialogue. The dialogue that you create between objects and, and natures, between people coming from different uh, places, uh, between past and present, between the other, which is Europe for you, uh, or the other that is uh, you for us. And, 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 and an important example was for me when I saw the, um, the work you did in Milano. When you covered uh, the, 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 the door of um, uh, Venice door, uh, with a very poor material. There was a reading again of the work of Cristo, but not to show um, pollution like he did. The fact that you were packaging <laughs> too much our story. But this was a way to indicate that uh, all the things we are surrounded with are the result of another kind of packaging, a packaging who's bringing to us the efforts and the values from people who has been working for us so far away. And you here you find it at the border and there is a wall and we're gonna break this wall, not in a negative sense, but in a creative sense, exactly as you Notice with your picture, with the plants coming out from a train. That's it. That's life. It's really beautiful. And that, that is something I read it in Mahatma Gandhi. Only a tea from Mahama and Mahatma. That's very curious. There's another uh, a very interesting person that uh, Sebastian and I love very much. Gandhi was always thinking, um, is it going to be useful what I'm doing for the people? And this is what you said just before. So uh, I will mention another uh, philosopher I like very much, which is Daisaku Ikeda, and he says uh, we should all have mentors. And mentors are those people who are able to con con convey spiritual values. Spiritual values not in the clerical sense. And the spiritual values in the sense to find the real value of human being. This is what you do. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Francesca. Grazie mille. Va il microfono? Va? Sì, ok. E, um, io bilancio un po' parlando in italiano. <ride> e passo la parola a Katrin. E, e per fare maybe Una domanda a Ibrahim o concludere la nostra discussione? Catherine. Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing that it, I would love to do after those two beautiful responses that we had um, to Ibrahim's talk would be to see if Ibrahim had any um, replies he would like to make to either Massimiliano Fuxas or Francesca Maria Corral. Hello. 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 Yes. Um, well, I guess, um, yeah, they, they were interesting yeah, remarks. Um, for me, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a question like um, what Massimiliano said about uh, the ethics. Um, yeah, for me, aesthetics in itself 
um, there is a certain sense of, um, I guess, uh, responsibility, which is somehow embodied within it in a way that practitioners, whether artists or architects or engineers, somehow must embody within what they do. Uh, so it's very important somehow to be able to understand at what levels these play and also um, how, yeah, how like um, spaces are uh, reorganized or how they are occupied and things like that. Uh, so for me, I, uh, it's also because I think maybe the training that I come from in art school that they, to be able to be an artist, uh, you somehow have to be able to resolve uh, the question of the ethics first in the way that you think about your place within the world. Um, so in response to both, uh, for me, fund, it's something that is uh, just fundamental in a way that we can somehow uh, readdress the world yeah, and what we contribute to it in a way. Yeah, so it's uh, for me, it's very exciting at least. I don't think that I will be able to practice or think like this, or many other practitioners will be able to do this in a different timeline. The, uh, we are only able to produce and think this way because of the events within history. So for me, that is also one thing which is important to look at. But at the same time, not to be able to repeat that, but we can be able to use those as uh, another point to be able to maybe create as, uh, to be able to use that uh, history, the paradox that it presents, to be able to open maybe another portal in which we can experience um, life differently. But not just like in relation to humanity, but in relation to all other things, um, the ecology in relation to the cosmos, every other thing that somehow can be able to push our, our sense of being within this uh, vast universe that we find ourselves in. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's it. Unless anyone else has a question, I can uh, jump in again now. I wanted to ask Ibrahim about the importance of particular working in particular locations. So, you know, within Ghana, you have chosen to decenter yourself in Tamale, so in the north, uh, and then root yourself in a new reading of national post-independence history through its material traces. So that would be one kind of part A of the question, talking about that particular location in Tamale in relationship with that history. And then part B would be when you work elsewhere, um, how you think about particular geographic and historical locations in relation to your very rooted work in Tamale in Ghana. Um, <clears throat> in uh, it. Uh, for me, it, it, it was always a very easy decision to make with regards to staying at home and working as an artist uh, because I want to be able to use the, yeah, the conditions which I come from as a starting point to be able to create this new reality that I'm working with. And I'm also against the idea of always remaining in the center. Uh, to be able to at least go to the rural or to the edge where you can be able to create new uh, forms that can somehow also influence uh, maybe uh, spaces or generation which is there. But I also went to this area because of the idea of uh, farming, because the land in which I placed the institution in was in the middle of a farm. So that also really gave me a, yeah, it was very inspiring to be able to think about the relationship between architecture and for instance, the uh, uh, production of food and also the attitude that goes into it in relation to the, the relationship between mankind and land across different areas. Because where I come from, when you buy uh, a land, a piece of land, you only own the land, uh, but you don't own what is on the land, like um, 
for instance, trees <laughs> uh, that you came to meet on the land. You could be in your house and someone in the community can come to cut the tree because maybe his uh, grandfather or ancestor planted it or something like that. Or if you buy a land uh, and it's there, other people can come and farm on it. So it's a very different kind of relationship as, in, uh, as against what happens in the center where capital and exploitation is at its peak. So I thought there was something to learn from it that in going to this rural area to be able to build, it already implicated the community within the future of the institution. And thinking about that in opposition, for instance, to the silo, when I bought the land of the silo, it came, the, it was the land, but it came with a building. It wasn't the building that I bought. <laughs> The government didn't sell the building to me. They sold the land to me. The land is always important. And I've realized that land, because a lot of young people always imagine that they would just go and work in like big institutions or companies in the South. But I always uh, remind them that why don't they go back to yeah, like small communities? And why don't they buy land and invest and do small things? which eventually will reshape the, the community. And of course, some t I'm not a person who would produce anything to be able to make uh, money in a community sense, but we can also deny that we also need uh, entrepreneurs in order to be able to, let's say, transform uh, economic activities within maybe certain regions. So I always tell them, why can't you even go within places and somehow risk the idea of yourself to be able to maybe create something new within a given space and context. So for me, that is important to be able to at least the site specific or like geogra uh, specific geographical areas present very different notions of what the world is. Of course, coming to this place, um, Naples has really also, it's been a really good time actually because I think in the midst of the pandemic, there aren't so many people around. So there's been an opportunity to travel. For instance, when we went to Pompeii, it was almost as if we were on a VIP tour. There was no one there. And the, the man who took us said, ordinarily there would be like 30,000 people in front of you. <laughs> so um, the, the, to be able to understand the complexity of uh, different spaces, a place like Naples with regards to the history, the multiple layers of history that it comes with, even with regards to how the city is organized, buildings, uh, the landscape, uh, looking at uh, um, um, buildings uh, or spaces, which are as a result of, let's say, the two world wars that we've experienced and how that has transformed certain social conditions. Of course, it's not the same that we have in Ghana because in Ghana, we only contributed, let's say, soldiers to fighting um, the, the Second World War. But if you're looking at, let's say, maybe certain kind of uh, attitude or social infrastructure that it comes with, it's very different. So for me, I like to pay attention to that and how maybe as an artist, I can be able to maybe also uh, take the yeah, some of the things I've done at home, like um, all this labor of trying to reestablish dialogue with uh, P, uh, spaces which ordinarily would not be within the conversation of like contemporary art framework, to be able to introduce that as an element within, let's say, if we decide that we're going to do something in Scampia, how ordinarily, like how would that play along? Like, the, it, is it, does it mean that uh, ideas could be borrowed from, let's say, places like uh, Tamale or maybe places in Congo which are visited or maybe in Zambia or elsewhere where maybe we could be looking at new models of economies that can allow f maybe for the work or the project to happen. So for me, that is very important to be able to at least, at, um, yeah, to be able to create that connection. Uh, look another, a couple more questions. Just uh, mm. uso l'italiano per bilanciare. <laughs> 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 eh, 
molto adesso pensavo che quando Ibrahim parlava tante sollecitazioni, tanti argomenti, tante analisi anche negli interventi di Massimiliano e Francesca che hanno centrato molti aspetti della ricerca di Ibrahim. Ma adesso mi chiedevo uno degli aspetti centrali, one of the aspects, the central aspect of your research, the relationship between ghosts and architecture. So we, you show a lot of pictures of your work, and then how do you see now uh, also a picture by Scampia. We visit together some place in Naples, industrial place in San Giovanni a Tetuccio. With Catherine you see other things and with the other person, other archaeological sites. So I think that it's very important in the spirit of our project, this connection between your research in Ghana and uh, your residence in Naples. And uh, it's not a question, but it's a reflection. What do you see in this um, relationship uh, between archaeological sites and modernist sites, you know, Pompeii and uh, Scampia and San Giovanni? Um, what are your, your interpretation of this relations if there are a relationship if there are an idea about that this place this ghost place hmm? in the spirit of your project for mother museum if there are um, yeah i i didn't speak about that um because sometimes i do forget about the some elements within the work because it's such a broad framework that I'm looking at that I sense to lose track of aspects of it. But the issue of the, the various different timelines has always been very, very important. So I guess in um, one of the key reasons why I acquired the silo was to be able to use that as a means to access, let's say, old archaeological findings and sites within Ghana itself. Um, for instance, in the north of Ghana, there have been many archaeological findings dating back to, let's say, the first, between the first and fifth century. Um, so those were some of the questions that I was asking myself uh, within the lockdown period and before that about how, because the images from underneath the silo, the excavations that we had to make, one of the ideas which I was working with was to be able to, because a lot of it was clay, was to be able to like take the material and to be able to create these kinds of uh, uh, objects which were almost as if uh, slabs or um, not pedestals per se, but slabs that could, because they are more or less like residues, they contain the ghost and everything. But what, what would be the relationship between that, for instance, and let's say, uh, 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 placing multiple layers of, let's say, archaeological findings on it in relation to the history of the building in a very modernist uh, context. And uh, so in being here, for instance, in, um, in Naples, I've been thinking a lot about that, like how to be able to at least create a, a project that is able to draw and bring these histories together, these various histories from different timelines coming of course, with very uh, different ghosts and all that, yeah. Because uh, Scampia has, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I've been dreaming about it in relation to all the, because the first time we went there, the, underneath the architecture, they had all these uh, parts of the buildings that were removed and dumped there. Yeah, so I was thinking about what kind of form that could take. And also other aspects of the building also seem very futuristic particularly when you're looking at the building from underneath and looking at how the stairways connect and all that. It almost looks like something you would find in a science fiction. So I'm thinking about the, of obviously the, the, the reality that it presents and how we can also somehow uh, maybe further uh, complicate it. Yeah. Ho spaventato e non voglio parlare, volevo solo salutare e chiudere ringraziando tutti. Io devo dire che stasera veramente mi pare una serata molto riuscita. Io ho visto che Ibrahim e tutti noi, tutti voi anzi, avete interpretato in pieno quello che era il mio, la mia idea, cioè che 
non so se è vero che l'arte ci salverà, però certamente ci aiuterà. E dall'altro lato anche l'arte va integrata in un contesto sociale, storico e territoriale, come Ibrahim fa e come tutti noi pensiamo che fa, dobbiamo fare e come il madre sta facendo nell'ultimo periodo in maniera eccellente. Quindi grazie a tutti e arrivederci. Thank you so much. Bye bye. And Ibrahim was fantastic. Ciao.